All right. Uh, so we began to discuss last time uh, conformal field theories, and I shall begin with a quick uh, summary of what we already learned. Uh, generally speaking, um, conformal uh, field theories are defined uh, as theories uh, invariant. Uh, you can actually define it in two ways. You can say, let's put the system in the gravitational field. Gravi the gravitational field is described by the metric tensor. Uh, and we say that the system is while invariant uh, if the change g mu nu to um, lambda of x g mu nu uh, leaves the Lagrangian or the theory invariant. That's a very general feature, while the while symmetry. Um, on the other hand, uh, we may be, if, uh, well, uh, the, by the way, the examples of uh, such, uh, the example of such symmetry, this symmetry was uh, noticed, as you see, uh, quite long ago, and um, in, in, in the usual uh, uh, classical field theories. On the classical level, it's very clean and simple uh, thing. Um, what would be the simplest system which has simplest uh, classical field theory which has this feature? Yeah, if you have Maxwell the if you have uh, the Maxwell theory, uh, then um, uh, it is described by the action which is square root of g g mu nu, g lambda gamma, f mu lambda, f nu gamma, um, d for x. So this is basic, f is the field strength, and I couple it to the metric tensor in this way. If you just take the wild transformation, you get a lambda minus 1 from here, lambda minus 1 from here, and lambda to the power plus 2 from here. So um, the system reacts uh, only on the mm, non-conformal part of the metric, uh, the conformal part. Is. Uh, in quantum theory, it's uh, much more subtle. The, the issue of wild symmetry is much more subtle and interesting. Um, but uh, it is... Uh, important to realize that it is present in these simple circumstances. And uh, we say that um, we can also, we may be also interested, we are actually also interested in the system without gravitational field. What then? Uh, then we said that uh, we consider the transformation law, x prime to f of x, and uh, actually, this, if we start with a, a Euclidean metric tensor, which is delta mu nu, it goes to, uh, we called it 1 plus rho delta mu nu, and this is just this lambda. So clearly, if we find such transformation, we said that uh, then uh, the, X, the Lagrangian like that will be Invariant. We can also, um, uh, so, so far I am talking just about classical naive symmetry. When we go further, we will find anomalies and all kind of anomalous dimensions, all kind of complications. But at the moment, we, are, we just study kinematics, very simple. Uh, and we discovered that in mm, Basically, we discovered that uh, the group, uh, the transformation group uh, of, of this system is, is very simple. Uh, you can, of course, have, uh, we are asking, 
by the way, suppose we are asking the uh, conditions, uh, not the conformal transformation, but just requ let's require that the new metric tensor is equal to the old metric tensor. Here we require something weaker. We are saying uh, the new metric tensor is a while transformed old metric tensor. We allow this factor. But let's suppose for one second that we don't allow it. So we require delta mu nu to delta mu nu. What kind of f we, we will be allowed to have in this case? Which geometrical? It's a simple geometrical question. Uh, although as many geometrical questions, it's the easiest way is to do some elementary algebra. Uh, which transformations preserve delta mu nu? Huh? Which is? Uh, it's rotational translation. And I actually recommend you to check this. We, we saw that for infinitesimal transformation, we have variation of of g mu nu equal to this thing. Um, and we basically say that if we want simply rotations and translations, we simply equate it to zero. Uh, but if we say that, let's assume, let's try some larger symmetry. Let us assume that uh, uh, we have conformal symmetry. What do we require of delta G? Delta G mu nu then is not necessarily zero, but what is it? What's the requirement which we impose on delta G mu nu to describe conformal group? Yeah, it should be just, uh, as we already know, it should be just raw delta mu nu. And then uh, the, um, the outcome in higher dimensions is, is that uh, we have transformations, uh, just rotations and translations, and uh, we have also um, the, we have to s supplement it with one, uh, with the one finite transformation, which is the inversion. Uh, and we can actually uh, write it uh, if we want, this is a finite transformation, and we don't have uh, infinite. Uh, if but we may want to have infinitesimal form of it, uh, of uh, some uh, conformal transformation. That's is, is that, that is easily achieved using these things. We first uh, take. That, as we discussed last time, is just x divided by x square plus some vector alpha. So we do inversion, we translate by alpha, and we return to it. And if alpha is infinitesimal, you will get uh, clearly the expression for delta x. Uh, which supplements these things. And so the parameters of conformal group are rotations, translations, and special conformal transformations. Say, in, uh, in, the, in the Maxwell case, the, um, in the Maxwell case, uh, we have um, uh, six, rot in four dimensions, we have six rotations, four translations, all in all, ten transformations, which is which form the Poincaré group, and we we add actually, actually I have forgotten to add the derivations. We add uh, four special conformal transformations and the derivations, and we have the symmetry of the Maxwell equation, which is a fifteen parameter group, and that was discovered actually very long ago, at the beginning of the nineteenth century. Um, mm, but uh, one more kinematical comment, and then we will uh, pass to dynamics. 
uh, first of all, uh, I, I hope it's clear that it's conformal invariant only in four dimensions. Um, what property of uh, electric charge we have? Uh, what, what is special in four dimensions for? For uh, we have an electric charge, and it's related to the fact that uh, it's. Uh, by the way, I hope you, uh, I hope it is clear that uh, we, we, this is lambda minus one, lambda minus one, and dimensionality comes from here. It it gives you lambda to the power of d divided by two because it's a determinant. Um, and it's, uh, to save time, just uh, the, um, the fact that uh, elec the, the action is, the electric charge is dimensionless in four dimensions. In other dimensions, it's not. Um, so, uh, you can also check, by the way, there's an interesting exercise, not completely trivial, that the Dirac equation, the massless Dirac equation, is also conformally invariant uh, in four dimensions. <coughs> okay. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. I, I need one more fact about it. Uh, in classical field theory, we define uh, uh, the energy momentum tensor. We can define by applying to the system gravitational field. So we say that uh, if we take some variation delta g mu, uh, we have the, so, so we then have some object which we call t mu uh, delta g mu, where the object is defined as the object, uh, of course this upper and lower indices, uh, the, the difference between the, them disappears when we go to the, uh, uh, to the flat case, to the case, to the Euclidean case. Uh, so, we define it as a variation of the action. T mu is simply a coefficient in front of delta G mu. You are given the action. And in this way, if you vary uh, this action, so for, for the Maxwell case, uh, we will get uh, just t mu nu, f mu lambda, f mu sigma, f nu uh, lambda minus one quarter delta mu nu, f lambda rho square. The standard energy momentum tensor, which reduces in components is, uh, say energy density is the square of electric field plus the square of magnetic field and so on. Now, uh, which property of this expression is responsible for conformal invariance? Traceless. Huh? Traceless. Traceless. Oh, why is that? Yeah. How, how do you... Uh, th that's the correct conclusion, but I just want Did the... Make yes. Then we'll get G, trace of That's right. We, we said that conformal transformation uh, delta G mu is rho G mu. So if the action is unchanged, uh, we, we get this thing. Now, if we take, uh, if we change coordinates in the flat space, uh, we have D mu epsilon mu plus D mu epsilon mu. Uh, we have uh, the, the variation uh, t mu nu, d mu epsilon nu, minus plus d nu epsilon nu. Um, and um, uh, this uh, variation, if for, for, for example, for, for epsilon conformal, it's zero. And we also can conclude that. Uh, uh, if you consider uh, uh, consider uh, the fields uh, subjected to the equations of motion, then the action must be stationary 
And from this, it follows that the energy momentum tensor is conserved. This is conservation of energy momentum. And as we saw, this uh, conformal symmetry requires that the trace of uh, energy momentum is zero. Um, uh, so this is uh, the result of the, Lorenz, of the Poincaré group uh, or of the Lorenz group. Uh, and this is the result of the confor of conformal theory. Um, and indeed, uh, the ma classical Maxwell theory satisfies all this. Mm. Uh, and uh, we also have a very important object, a very important uh, statement in in the theory, uh, this time in the quantum theory, which is the word identity. Let me, uh, since um, much of our discussion will be based on the word identity, let me remind you how it appears in quantum electrodynamics. Let's start uh, uh, Start with something which you in encountered many times, I assume, uh, and then we will generalize it to somewhat less, uh, to somewhat uh, uh, more exotic, slightly more exotic. Uh, so, um, in quantum electrodynamics, we say that if we have we have charge conservation, let's assume that we have many fields, and we get. Uh, transformation of gauge transformation. E is the charge, alpha is a function of x, uh, and uh, we have the vertex operator, uh, excuse me, uh, vertex part, uh, gamma mu, which depends on q and p, and uh, the word identity is uh, simply um, if we have uh, well in the case in the most in the standard electrodynamics is, it tells you that is g mu minus g mi minus of p when you have only one charge. Uh, more generally, however, if you have um, some amplitude like that, where here you have particles. A1, A2, and so on, and you couple a photon, the, this line corresponds to the photon, and uh, in this case, uh, this generalized gamma mu, we take legit total divergence of this thing, and of these amplitudes A1, An, it depends on Q, P1, Pn, and the uh, expression, uh, if you, the, the, the word identity we will discuss is uh, elementary derivation in a second, but I first want uh, to write it down, is, is expressed in terms of the Green function, um, G, we will have sum over A, Ea, G, of P1, Pa plus Q, Pn. I assume here that all particles are incoming or outgoing, that's just, so the sum of all momenta is zero. Uh, now, mm, uh, th this is uh, the uh, generalization of this thing. Uh, I remind you how it, uh, the derivation of it is uh, simply that um, you take the functional integral. Well, let me. Oh, what? So, sorry, say it again. Oh, for an equal good question. Oh, well, in this, uh, yeah, it depends on whether you uh, amputate the, the legs or not. Uh, actually, here I 
it's, I probably should write it down. I, I, I write it down, unamputated thing, then it will be a thing like that, and that it will be the same thing. Um, now, uh, just for, for you to, well, let me ask you a question. Um, Oh, maybe I shall ask it a, little, uh, a second later. Um, uh, uh, the derivation, I remind you the standard derivation. You take infinitesimal variation, uh, infinitesimal gauge transformations for the field A. And you change variables in your functional integral uh, by changing psi to psi plus delta psi. You just change variables, and if you have a certain expression here, some green function, any green function, then uh, you have two terms. Let's suppose we are in the Euclidean. You have two terms uh, which, com which must compensate each other because functional integral is the same uh, in any variables. It's just change of variables. Uh, so uh, the, the integral changes because delta S changes, g mu, d mu alpha, where j mu is the total electric current. You again define the total electric current as a coefficient in front of this thing. And uh, so you get d mu after integrating by part g mu psi of x1 psi of xn. And you have to account for the terms coming from variation of psi. Well, if I want to be precise, I, I should put, put alpha of x here. And on the right-hand side, there will be a variation of those psi, um, and it will give me psi of x1, and then certain th some of the terms, uh, a certain term will be varied. And you plug in this expression. As a result, you get, since alpha is arbitrary, you get sum over A uh, integral, uh, uh, sum over a delta of x minus x a psi of x one and in this way I which I, I, it's just meant as a reminder for you that uh, all these word identities are derived by by changing variables in um, function in the functional integral. And this is just the momentum representation of the same equation. Mm. Uh, and you can check it order by order in Feynman diagrams. Now a question to you which I wanted to ask before. Um, uh, what would be the classical limit of what, what kind of statement uh, we get uh, corresponds to the classical limit of the word identity? Well, um, you see, the identity which precisely corresponds to the word identity of quantum theory is just the Netter theorem. Word identity is nothing but quantum Netter theorem. Uh, why is that? You probably can uh, remember how we prove the Netter theorem. Yeah, right. We, we, we don't integrate. We, we just take this expression and we say uh, all the proof of Noether theorem is simply to say if, if the equations of motion of, are satisfied, then the action is stationary, therefore d mu g mu is equal to zero. And we, when we do the same thing in the functional integral, it's a quantum version of it. And, um, so it's just important to realize. Now, let's take a look uh, that the symmetry leads to conservation law. How you derive the conservation law from here? Uh, 
look at this identity and uh, interpret it as a conservation law. Uh, it's easier, you can do it with DMU, but uh, it's easier in the momentum space. Um. It's, it's just staring at you from the blackboard. That is, uh, I'm not asking any, any, any complicated questions, that's just... Uh, uh, what? Uh, it's like something like momentum. Uh, well, actually, set Q to zero. Set Q to zero, left-hand side is zero. Uh, Right-hand side is, doesn't depend on Q, but it's proportional to sum over A of EA. It must be zero. So we have, when you have, if you have incoming particles, then uh, they uh, must satisfy conservation of charge. Um, uh, by the way, one more interesting thing from this simple, I'm spending this uh, some time for this because in that will be one of the building blocks of CFT using this type of idea. Not these identities, um, the identities for energy momentum tensor, but they all have the same origin. Um, okay, uh, another interesting thing. Suppose that uh, the, uh, we, uh, the symmetry, in this case is charge conservation symmetry, is spontaneously broken. Uh, so suppose it's spontaneously broken and uh, sum of Ea is not equal to zero. Uh, that's, that happens when the vacuum doesn't have the symmetry of uh, the ground state. What would be your conclusion from, um, uh, fr from this? From this identity? To govern the uh, Q goes to zero limit of the get of the Gamma. Say it again. Probably implies the behavior of the gamma as Q goes to zero. That's right, and uh, uh, quite quite correct, but more concretely. Yeah, it's a pole, and this is what is called the Goldstone theorem, uh, which is just uh, a consequence of this identity that uh, if you spontaneously break continuous symmetry, then you expect to have massless particles. Poles in the amplitudes correspond to massless particles. Um, there is a, an interesting subtlety here, uh, uh, because uh, there is also the, uh, the, when you have gauge fields, uh, the massless particles disappear as, as you no, uh, the question is how it is compatible uh, with the what I do. And you see, whether we have gauge fields or we don't have gauge fields, uh, the identity is the same. Um, and in quantum electrodynam electrodynamics, we do have gauge fields. So it seems a bit uh, strange that uh, Well, you see the paradox uh, here, mm, but probably we don't need it. Uh, but uh, still, it's an interesting paradox that uh, if even if we have uh, gauge fields which are supposed to eliminate all massless particles, uh, like in the standard model, we still have this identity. And this identity dictates us that if sum of Ea sum is not zero, then uh, gamma has a pole, and uh, it's. Uh, shall I leave it? I shall leave it to you for the ex for the home exercise. Try to find out the reason. This this paradox have has a very precise resolution. Of course, there is no problem here. But everything is fine. But why it is fine is not so obvious. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I shall leave this.
um, for the exercises. Um, and uh, I shall only add a, a kind of a, an obvious remark uh, that here we dealt with, with the abelian symmetry, which is the simplest uh, case. In the non-abelian case, it's basically the same, except that you have E's are uh, matrices of the Lie algebra of the group. So, um, but basically, apart from slightly more complicated notations, you, you don't get uh, anything new. It's just the same. Uh, you do get any, something new uh, when you consider non-abelian case and several, several currents. Uh, in this case, you get the so-called low energy theorems which tells you how these massless particles uh, scatter on each other and on other particles. And the last comment about that uh, is um, uh, that uh, when we have uh, the, the uh, most, uh, the easiest and most visual uh, uh, case uh, of those, these massless particles is in the magnet with continuous symmetry. So imagine some uh, um, Ising-like magnet, uh, but with sim not with symmetry Z2, but with the symmetry O3. Then this argument, there are precisely the same word identities or quantum natter theorem, uh, which tell you that there are poles. And these poles uh, correspond to what? How to interpret them physically in the case of magnetic system? Huh? Yeah, but what is, why, why, why they, they must have, my, why they have zero mass? That's the question. Why do we get uh, excitation? Indeed, the statement is that you always have, when the symmetry is broken, you always have a massless excitation in the system. Uh, and my question is what are, how to interpret this? Uh, physically. Why the wavelengths uh, very wavelength excitations don't take any energy to, cre to be created. Because you, uh, because you have a spin wave which is inhomogeneous, uh, when you have some inhomogeneous uh, configuration of spins, it takes some energy. However, then you tend the wavelength to infinity, it all reduces to the rotation of spins as a whole, and that doesn't take energy. And that's the meaning of this formula. Okay, um, now let's go back to, after this long digression, let's go back uh, to the conformal field theory. Mm. Uh, we saw last time that uh, when we have the three-point function, or maybe more, uh, if you have three operators, a of x1, b of x2, c of x3, they, they must be equal some constant x12 delta a plus delta b minus delta c x13 delta a plus delta c minus delta b and x23 delta b plus delta c minus delta a you see the simple rule by which uh, it's very easy to remember this formula because you simply say that if you have two points x12, then you have two operators uh, delta A plus delta B and it goes. Now, 
Mm, what's one important feature of this? Of this formula. By the way, this is uh, this formula is written for the scalar operators, but uh, there are of course corresponding formulas for vectors, tensors, and so on. Um, uh, now, uh, but but this formula t and excuse me, I, sh I I need one more one more thing. Uh, if you have the four point function, though. The four-point function is not so easy. The conformal symmetry uh, determines it uh, only. So oh, it, it has some. It determines it's proportional to the function to the unknown function, uh, which is uh, which contains the so-called unharmonic ratios, which is uh, say x one two square. Uh, x three four square divided by x one three square, x two four square, and one more ratio like that. Uh, you see, uh, the reason uh, why this unknown function is so th that that is the disappointing conclusion that symmetry is not powerful enough. It still allows an arbitrary function for starting from the four point function. Um, the reason why it is um, the check that it is indeed conformally invariant is very simple because we uh, learned last time that under conformal transformation we have this uh, transformation law. This is the, the scale change at the point one, this is the scale change at the point two. And all those lambda, that's how I remember this formula. I just wrote down so that all uh, here I will get lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4, and the same in denominator. Uh, so the four-point function um, by symmetry itself is not determined. It's determined by dynamics. Mm. And that's what we will we'll see. Now let's look at the limit when two operators you have the operator C somewhere here and operators A and B somewhere here. Uh, then it is, nat it is a natural idea, uh, which turns out to be correct, uh, that you can somehow replace this product of two operators uh, by one operator. Uh, namely, in other words, uh, th this operator C, when it watches operators A and B, is somewhat myopic and uh, actually uh, cannot resolve them if the uh, two points are close to each other. Uh, let's see if, it, if it's true using this formula. So, when we we are talking about the limit uh, x12 much smaller than uh, x13 and x23. And in this limit, uh, we will have this x13, uh, if we call this r, and we call this r. You, you see that the asymptotic behavior is r to the power of delta c uh, minus uh, delta r a minus delta b. 1 divided by r to the power 2 delta c. because uh, you have uh, uh, this thing, uh, this delta C adds, and so on. So it's kind of clear. So we have this asymptotic behavior uh, of, uh, of the three-point function. And now I want, 
you to uh, well let's interpret each term so let's start with with this one what is the origin of this term how would you interpret in terms of operators it's a two-point function of C yes so we can write it down uh, we can write it down as uh, R delta C minus delta A minus delta B uh, multiplied by C of 0, C of R. In other words, uh, we replaced A of R, B of 0 can be replaced by R delta C minus delta A minus delta B. Uh, um, so uh, the, this symbolic formula uh, means it has a very uh, concrete meaning. Um, although I write it down as, as if these are operators, it should be understood. In the, in the following way, um, that uh, in the case of three-point function is just, that it's nothing new, it's just a matter of interpretation of the exact formula. But uh, we can try to apply it to the higher point function. Namely, let's assume that uh, we have uh, a correlation function with some um, C of R D of R plus R prime and whatever. So let's consider the endpoint function. Um, but in this endpoint function we have an insertion, the, we take two points to zero. So instead of this picture I want now to consider the picture when these two points are very close, all others are anywhere and they are different operators. And in this case uh, I will postulate uh, I will postulate that uh, in the limit we have the so-called operator algebra, namely uh, these uh, two point functions, these two colliding points can be replaced uh, by the sum of various operators. In particular the operator C, but also there will be some others, um, as, as you will see. So that will be the, uh, the, the, this postulate of operator algebra is very, operator product expansion it's called usually, uh, is very powerful. It actually replaces all axioms of usual field theory, of naive field theory like canonical commutation relations and things like that. Uh, you, will see, uh, you will see that in a moment. Um, um, So, but we have to resolve a couple of paradoxes before we move. So we uh, assume that, well, excuse me, once, uh, one more question before we go further. Uh, the question, why we have this exponent here? Why? Uh, we have we when we replace this thing, we indeed get we explain that what we get is this this uh, term, which is as you correctly said is a two point function. But why this term? Why this uh, small r as r goes to zero? It's just scaling because in any in we most generally. We shall write down things. If 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 uh, the total, if uh, we, we put something else, it will be. Mm. 
Oh, by the way, one more question. Suppose we have a free field. Let's check our hypothesis, which is not completely formulated yet. I'm just taking you closer and closer to the general formulation of the uh, of the axioms of, of conformal field theory. Um, uh, suppose we, and, and for that we need a lot of examples. We have free field phi of x, um, and, and, the, and we look at the product, free massless fields. Uh, what would be the, in the leading order, the operator product expansion in this case? Suppose we are in four dimensions. What would be the structure of the operator product? And again, I'm saying that uh, uh, that uh, when we write it in this operator way, what we really mean is that you insert this equality inside the correlation, inside the correlation function. And then you get the concrete statement about the behavior of correlation functions and some arguments go to. What? How many dimensions? Four. Yes, it will be 1 or x square multiplied by the unit operator. And what would be the next term? True. And then x to the 0, what we call phi square plus higher terms. Uh, this x to the 0 means that uh, uh, in a sense, you see, naive dimensions typically uh, satisfy the condition that they are additive. Delta C is delta A plus delta B. But there is like the, uh, the, this difference is like a binding energy, you see? It's like a binding energy. It's, uh, you uh, take two operators A and B close by, and you would, ex the, uh, the, over naive expectation would be, which is wrong, would be that uh, the dimension of the uh, composite object is simply delta A plus delta B, but that's not the case. Um, it's a different, uh, it's a different number. Now there's also another question. When I'm saying, uh, what I'm going to say is the general operator algebra in a very general way, we just say without specifying the operators at first, uh, sum over L, there will be some constant F and ML, uh, R to the power delta L minus delta M minus delta N, and multiplied by OL, say, at the point zero. Or if you can take the middle point, it's just the change. It will be the same. Um, uh, and the immediate question which I want to ask you is how it happened that uh, in this case we obtained only one term. We didn't get all higher operators. Uh, we just get... Uh, uh, yes. yes. Because other points are zero. It? Yeah, it's because for different dimensions, they are zero here, but they are not zero in the four-point function. So, in general, mm. Mm. In general, we should expect uh, this type of operator algebra. Um, and there will be, which essentially means that the, say, the four-point function can be written down like that. You take n or n 
uh, or M. Uh, here you have the uh, sum over operators. Well, I should use other letters here, PQ. Uh, and you have to sum over all possible operators. Um, what is what, what it is? Uh, I will. Uh, I mean, what, what kind of operators can appear? We will discuss in, uh, very soon. But at the moment, just imagine that there is some infinite set of operators, and um, there is uh, the so-called. Uh, uh, there is uh, the bootstrap condition, uh, namely. Uh, you can imp you can actually insert the operators here, but it should be the same as inserting it in a different channel. Uh, and in this case, MQ, and uh, we will get some highly non-trivial relation for this constant. What it reminds you, which part of mathematics should come to mind immediately when you uh, get some condition like that? There is, try to rem uh, remember Lie algebras or group theory, Lie groups or, or algebras. Uh, what would be the analog of F? It's structure constant, and what would be the analog of uh, this bootstrap condition? Associativity, uh, associativity correct. And uh, this is called the Jacobi identity. Uh, yes, it is associativity. Actually, in both cases, we, we simply have these operator product expansions and uh, impose the associativity condition. Mm. And uh, that was basically the uh, uh, the dream of uh, what, 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 how it could look, namely uh, that uh, in the case of Lie algebra, uh, we know this beautiful, simple uh, classification. There is the Jacobi. You basically look for the solutions of the Jacobi identity, and you find that there are. Uh, these solutions are classified by the Dinkin diagrams, and you have one of the most beautiful parts of mathematics as a result. Uh, the hope uh, is that maybe uh, in this infinite algebra, it's infinite algebra, and it's infinitely more complicated than uh, uh, the group theory than the simple group theory. But maybe there is also some kind of uh, discrete number of possibilities which can be viewed. Or at least we can try to uh, find uh, some solutions of, of this uh, bootstrap condition. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, <coughs> there is uh, uh, about Lie algebra. Uh, was quite amusing recollections by the great physicist Murray Gelman, maybe the only living great physicist, uh, who describes uh, um, how in the 50s he didn't know about the algebras, but he worked on symmetry of elementary particles. And uh, he was deriving conditions for uh, consistency of Young Mills theory without realization that he is trying to classify Lie algebras. And he says he was at Collège de France at that time and uh, went to lunch uh, with uh, the great, great mathematician Serre, who was a super expert in Lie algebra. Algebras. Uh, but it so happened that they never talked about science at lunch. Uh, and uh, uh, it took 
a lot of time from Gelman to realize that some, somebody pointed out to him that what his problem was just, he was just solving the problem of classification of the algebra, which is already solved. But then he adds an interesting point. He said, I think he was solving concrete identity, working with the Jacobi identity or their analog and so on. But he said that probably if I asked Professor Sir about it, he would write down something like that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I would never understand. <laughs> it's a very interesting <laughs> recollection. <laughs> Mm. Um, okay, anyway, after this digression, uh, yes, go ahead. I your argument for the three-point function. I replace ABC with ABD, say. I say a different operator, ABD. Yeah, yeah, but A, B, and C are arbitrary. Uh, I mean, here we get A, B, and there's a contribution of C. Now, let's... And, and we use it for the, so we have A, B, C, and we replace A and B by C, so we get C and C. Now, try, the, the, in, the, in this operator product, there is a term, definitely there is a term C plus D plus E and all alphabet uh, uh, late in another life. Uh, now, why we don't see this thing? Is that your question? Yeah. Uh, because if you try the D term here, you will get... So if D has different dimension than C, this is zero by conformal symmetry. We showed that... Uh, what if they have the same dimension? Then? The what? If they have the same dimension. Uh, if they are the same dim dimension, then this is... Uh, uh, of course, then uh, the, the, you 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 can oh, the, then you have two operators and you can always orthogonalize them. You you have so that uh, there will be only one operator. You will you will have operator C and D, and uh, you will exp you you will form some orthogonal combinations of C and D, and as a result, uh, only the D will be C plus something orthogonal to C. As, and only C will contribute. This will be orthogonal and will give you zero. Yes? I just have a little remark about Gelman. He said that he tried to find an object similar to poly matrices, but more than three of them. Yes. And he said he went all the way up to seven, and when he, uh, when he lost his hope. But the professor said that actually he needed to just... Get one step higher. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you do yeah, 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 yeah. That's. Actually, I remember reading Gellman's paper. I learned. Uh, eventually, he wrote. Uh, he and Glasher wrote a very nice paper, which contained. Class uh, they finally learned classification of the algebra, and it was very nice exposition. Actually. Um, mm. <coughs> I actually recommend you to take a look at his uh, collected papers, which are, this is taken from his, this memoirs, memoirs from his collected papers and published by World Scientific. Uh, very interesting reading, very impressive. He for, uh, I think he, for 30 years at least, he, he, he was fantastic. He was always moving in the right direction. Um, this, this argument doesn't seem to depend on whether C and D are organized or not. Uh, no, the argument, well, the, this formula doesn't contain D at all, yes? And um, actually, you see what will happen is you have, suppose you have C and D which are degenerate. Uh, then uh, you will have, uh, if you s look uh, only at the three-point function, you will, um, you will be unable to distinguish between these two contributions. You will always get the same thing. So um, 
in this case, you will get C plus D, and there will be another operator, C minus D, orthogonal to this, which will not appear. So you just change the uh, basis of the operators and uh, call it C twiddle, and then it will be the C twiddle. Uh, so uh, what I mean is that you will not notice, uh, my, my argument basically was uh, that uh, uh, that the operators with other dimensions, they, they do not contribute. But if you simply plug it in, the correlation function of C, then you, for the general dimension, you indeed can have CD operator. That's not forbidden. Um, OK, let's, uh, let's proceed a little bit. Mm, to, the problem is to make uh, this uh, ge very general scheme concrete. And uh, it is possible to make it fairly concrete and uh, highly non-trivial in two dimensions. There are some separate, uh, and in 2D it's more or less the picture is clear. Uh, in 3D it's far from clear, but there are some hopeful uh, comments um, on what's going on. We don't, there is no complete theory in 3D, uh, but uh, the impression is that there is something, some hidden symmetry in this operator product expansion and things like that, so maybe one day it will be um, uncovered. In 2D, it's indeed fantastically close to the Dinkin diagrams and uh, Lie algebras and so on. So in general, what? In general, that should be uh, well, uh, it's, it's more than that. You see, it's not simply Kasmudi algebra. It's, these are operators which uh, depend not on one dimensional parameter, it depend on two dimensions and so on. So it's not, it's not well, let me tell you what it is not. Uh, it's not the standard uh, uh, Kasmudi algebra, or it's not a, any algebra studied by mathematicians. In the first place, uh, F here is symmetric. It's not anti-symmetric. It's uh, in Katz-Moody case, you study similar relations, but it's anti-symmetric. But that's right, the Katz-Moody do play, uh, uh, algebras do play some important role as symmetries, but, uh, well, let me proceed to this. But, but they're not, they're, they're uh, Certainly not the pre exactly the algebras we are we are talking. These are called kind of uh, fusion rules and uh, operator product expansion and so on. But and that's not the mathematical Lie. It's not a Lie algebra by itself. The algebra play important role in the in the solution. Okay, how how to approach this? The first thing which we need is the um, is to use the word identity. I will be mostly uh, concerned with uh, with two dimensions, and we have to uh, first to look at the energy momentum tensor and some. some operators. Uh, the, as we saw, there's a, uh, the, 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 there is an expression from the uh, word identity or quantum um, matter theorem. Uh, there is an expression for this, uh, for, the, for this divergence. Uh, and by itself, it's not sufficient uh, to find the correlation function of T mu with the others. Uh, why it's not sufficient? Because um, you see, in, we are in two dimensions. In, we have uh, the symmetric tensor. It has uh, 
It has uh, how many? Three components, yes. Uh, we have T11, T22, and T12. So we have three unknown functions. Uh, and what's the number of the equations? And only two equations. So uh, generally speaking, that's not enough. For it's the same reason for which you cannot use uh, uh, I can't resist telling you another story. Uh, um, uh, you see, you might try to solve quantum electrodynamics by using what identity? So you have Q mu, gamma mu, and it's equal to something, and then you plug it in, you determine gamma mu, and, and plug it in into the Dyson equation. Uh, and it seems you would get uh, a closed integral equation. Mm. Actually, <laughs> when I was an uh, undergraduate student at the beginning, my friend Nick Dahl and I, we, we didn't realize that it, it does not determine gamma completely. And we, did, we found some expression for gamma and then played uh, with the resulting integral equations thinking that this is a, we are solving quantum electrodynamics and then one day um, uh, he called me and then said that you know I found some express some eigenvalue with this equation and this eigenvalue is expressed for the it determines the charge but it's expressed in some numbers pi and e and square roots and so on um, I took a slide rule started calculated and then I was breathless because I got 1 divided by 137. <laughs> uh, uh, that was a practical joke. <laughs> the project collapsed very soon. <laughs> and I didn't realize immediately it was a practical joke. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, mm. anyway, uh, we have not. Uh, we need uh, more equations here. Uh, in fact, in conformal field theory, the correlate, correlation function of T minu is determined completely, uh, and you probably can tell me why. We, wh what will be one more equation which we, which we can use to determine this correlation function? If we know traces. traces, so if you add traces, then you have two unknowns and two equations. And uh, to write down, uh, uh, to write down uh, the resulting equation, we actually should note it. Should, we should. Uh, realize we should say should postulate how these operators transform under conformal transformations uh, the under scale transformations we already know this the new O n is lambda to the delta n uh, in the conformal case uh, we, we have the there should be something where f of x is a conformal transformation. This something uh, should be the natural uh, thing for this something is the local scale. The local scale uh, is um, uh, it, you can define it in as, so we have take lambda of x to the delta n and mm, in s s we now can go to two dimensions and in two dimensions uh, we have the transformation c twiddle f of c uh, and complex conjugate 
and um, the transformation law for the operators, uh, which which depend on z and z bar, uh, will be um, df dz absolute value to the power two delta n o n of f. Um, so, uh, so the result of it, uh, infinitesimally, that means let's expand it, and let's so let's look at the um, f of z is dz uh, is z plus epsilon. Epsilon of z, <coughs> uh, and they, the, the, now there is this important uh, thing that uh, it one term comes from here. It will be uh, d epsilon of z t z o n plus uh, delta d z epsilon. And a plus complex conjugate. Uh, so that this formula with with the local scale uh, uh, gives you a, a natural transformation law. But it's clear that and, and the operators with this transformation laws are called primary operators. But it is quite obvious that. Uh, I should have explained, uh, if I didn't, uh, why uh, why I'm looking for at this po uh, at this point why I'm looking for the transformation laws of these operators. They needed to write down the word identities. As as you remember, the word identity contains two parts. One is a total divergence, and the other uh, is expressed in terms of the vari variation of this. Fields. So to get what identity, I need this. Um, I, I need this uh, transformation laws, and you immediately see that um, it's not the only operator which appears. We have derivatives that. Is, let's consider the derivative of a primary operator. Let's suppose that we have some some object d z o n. Um, the derivative will transform uh, differently. Variation of the derivative will be uh, mm, dz uh, epsilon of z o n plus delta dz epsilon o n. Uh, which will give us uh, the following. It will give us epsilon of z, dz o n, plus delta plus 1. You see that delta plus 1 comes uh, from the differentiation of epsilon. Wait a second, Major. There is a mistake here. I start again. This um, it's not really a mistake. Yeah, no, I, I I will write more carefully. <coughs> so uh, we have to differentiate epsilon d z o n plus delta d z epsilon o n, and when you differentiate it. You will get uh, you will get the following for the operator. Let's call this operator O n prime. Uh, you get the formula that variation of O n prime. At, at first, it goes nicely like before. 
there will be delta plus 1. Um, but, uh, delta plus 1 I explained where it comes from, but there is also the anomalous term, which is delta dz square epsilon or n. Uh, so the prime of this secondary operator is expressed not, its variation expressed not in terms of itself only, but also uh, from this, uh, in terms of these primary operators. And, uh, we will, and these secondary operators are very important. Without them, you will not be able to solve the bootstrap condition. Um, so, um, and moreover, we will see that uh, there are huge number. That's not the only primary operator which we have. There are secondary operator which we have. There are a whole bunch of them. And the main lesson, the reason, one of the reasons I'm discussing this is that the, it shows how subtle and complicated field theory is. Uh, how different objects are balanced with each other and so on. So it's really amazing. It's a fantastic mathematical beauty. But for that we need this to suffer from through the structure of those primaries, secondaries and so on. What identities. Um, and I wish uh, something like that would exist in 3D. I, I, I actually kind of believe it. Um, but. Uh, not many evidence so far. Mm. Okay, uh, and, and now it's very easy to derive the energy momentum tensor because we can form the complex, it's convenient uh, for the traces case to form complex energy momentum tensor, say T. Sometimes I will call it simply T, sometimes T++. plus uh, plus. It's the same light cone coordinates which we discussed. And um, it is uh, actually T11 minus T22 plus 2I T12. If you take this combination, which is uh, uh, kind of a natural, simple thing, then uh, dz bar, or d sometimes I call it dz bar, sometimes d minus, that's in the uh, let, uh, I, I, I should ex bef before I write this equation, I should explain to you what's going on. Uh, the in two-dimensional notations, the general energy momentum tensor contains T uh, plus plus, for example, and T minus minus, and the trace S, which is T plus minus, and the conservation law is D minus T plus plus is equal to D plus S. And that, as, as we discussed, is inc not, not good enough. We need to set the trace. This is the trace because it is invariant under rotations. Uh, plus and minus compensate each other. We need to set S to zero. And, that, and then you have a meaningful equation. Um, and the equation is, if you have a bunch of, of the primaries, uh, you will have, uh, you will have uh, the sum of uh, delta k um, dz of delta z minus zk. Uh, plus mm, delta of z minus zk dzk applied to the correlation. It's actually it's not. It's xk. O and one and so on, and this should be equal to. 
and uh, yeah, and that, that that's equal to each other, and that expresses uh, in, in in a moment I shall write down the full word identity, which expresses the correlator of energy momentum tensor. Oh, we are getting late. Uh, correlation of energy momentum tensor with all these things. Uh, now it's uh, a, 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 let me explain what the strategy, why we are doing this. Um, we are doing this because we will be able to generate um, the so-called conformal families, the operators which are obtained by operator product of T, of several T and O. And these conformal families uh, are extremely important for solving the bootstrap condition. Turns out that in many cases you have just finite number. You see, we cannot have finite number of operators here uh, because associativity will never be satisfied. Uh, that's obvious to see. Uh, we need infinite number, but we, it's difficult to work with infinite number of operators. So instead we will get finite number of conformal families, each of which is, has precise description and uh, has infinite number of operators. So that, and using this we will be able to uh, find anomalous dimensions. Uh, that's uh, the strategy, but now we have to stop. Why does uh, associativity not imply uh, Okay, um, it's uh, because well, you see when you have finite number um, of operators, uh, you will have, uh, it's um, actually, mm, quite clear even here, uh, here we will have infinite, uh, if, if you have a finite number, you will, uh, your ex you, you will be expanding in R. Yeah, so you have the four point function and uh, you are expanding in R. And there will be some maximal power of R which enters this expansion. But on the other hand, it will never reproduce the singularity than this point collides with this point. You will have the term r to some power, to some fixed power, and uh, some function of other distances, r1, r2, r3. But we know that uh, the bootstrap condition tells you that you, you should, it, r, here enters asymmetrically. You see, it's, um, well, let me explain it better. Um, the structure of the uh, four point function, which you obtain with the hypothesis of finite uh, number of operators, will be r to the power of some delta max or minus all others. Um, multiplied by the function of R1, R2, R3. These functions must be symmetric under interchange. On, on the other hand, the four-point function is symmetric function of four points, uh, which means that if it has a singularity, for example, at, as R1, uh, it should have a... Um, how shall I put it? It will never be symmetric. My, the statement is, uh, you can easily check it, that uh, this, the function of, of this type will never be symmetric function of four points. That's, and therefore, uh, it should be there should be no delta max. It should go to infinite. Uh, there should be infinite number of terms. If we want to obtain, suppose we have a single operator, call it phi, we have a symmetric function of, of four coordinates. And we called x1 minus x2, we called r. 
this function is singular when you collide any two points. Um, and um, call it R. Uh, and if R, uh, if it depends on R only, if it is just some sum of of the terms R to the s s certain exponents, which is bounded, um, uh, the simple mathematical statement is that such function will never be symmetric. Uh, so that's why we need infinite number of operators. Moreover. Uh, here we also have, uh, I'm, uh, maybe it was not completely clear, it's uh, uh, when you look at this thing, um, I said that uh, because CD is zero for different dimensionalities, I said there's only C operator which is contributing. That's not quite, uh, that's imprecise actually, I, I just didn't, go, didn't want to go into it details at that point, but uh, it's imprecise uh, because there are infinite number of other operators, like operators uh, d alpha c, d alpha d beta c, and so on. And they all contribute to the operator product expansion, but these are secondary operators. The theorem which we proved last time was that CD is equal to zero for wrong di for different dimension. It's on the other hand, C and D alpha C is non is obviously non-zero if C and C, if, if the two-point function is non-zero. So what's the exp what's the resolution here? Why the th we, we proved that any two operators with different dimensions as do not correlate and at the same time it contradicts this elementary thing because you can take c of zero and uh, d, d, d alpha c of x and it's clearly d alpha of c of zero c of x and that's non-zero. It's a uh, vector. Uh, well, you, you can have actually this, the Laplacian of this. Any thoughts? Yeah, the point is that when we proved it, we assumed uh, that transformation law is that of the primary operators. Primary and secondary can, uh, can have non-zero um, correlation function. Uh, and they do have, as, as we see. It's only for primaries. Uh, so what this, the precise statement uh, w was that AB, the only thing which contributes here is AB is C, where C is, uh, can, is oh, this notation usually means that uh, you have not only the primary operator, but all its secondaries. And these secondaries contain, not, they are simple derivatives in higher dimensions, but in two dimensions we will see that uh, there are infinitely more, infinitely more each uh, uh, collection of secondary operators. There, there are secondary operators which are not which cannot be presented as derivatives of the primaries in 2D. And we will classify them all by using word identity.